Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this launch of a new initiative at California Humanities called California on the Ballot. This first event is called What's the Deal with Direct Democracy? And uh, this initiative will be rolling out over the next few months. And so keep an eye out for additional events such as this and others. Um, we'd like to thank our main funder on this, the uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as part of their Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Particip Participation Initiative, um, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils. Uh, so I'm John Lightfoot. I'm a senior program officer at California Humanities. And for anyone who's new to us, we're an independent nonprofit and a state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We've been producing and supporting public humanities events and programs around the state of California for roughly 45 years. The idea for today's session um, really sprung out of a conversation we had among staff where we were talking about the various statewide initiatives currently on the ballot at, on the ballot. And we all figured just how difficult it really was to sort of make sense of them and figure out what the implications might be for the state of California. Uh, so with that in mind, the goal today is not to necessarily talk about or debate what's currently being proposed, but really to ask a more fundamental humanities question, question, which is, how did we get here? How did we get to this point? And what can we learn from the history of California's experiences with direct democracy? Enough from me. Um, let me hand the mic to Rachel and introduce Rachel Myro, who's the senior editor at KQED's Silicon Valley desk. And I want to thank her in advance for leading what will no doubt be an informative and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, John. Uh, really looking forward to this. We've got some great panelists here. And for those of you diehards who are in it for an hour with us, uh, we promise a really great conversation. Uh, let me introduce our panelists very briefly. We've got uh, Joe Matthews, California and Innovation Editor for Zocalo Public Square, and co-author of California Crack Up, How Reform Broke the Golden State and How We Can Fix It. Uh, Dr. Rafe Sunshine, Executive Director of the Pat Brown Institute for Public Affairs at CS Cal State LA is what I should say. Right. I've been calling this guy since I was a cub reporter when I needed to know what time it is in California politics and he never disappoints. And last but not least, Jason Cohn, Director, as you've just heard of The First Angry Man. See it. If you haven't seen it, you'll get a few clips coming up in just a moment. But um, it, if you have lived in California at any point from the 1970s on, this documentary will explain so much. Uh, well, I think we should start with a clip. Why not? Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Read my lips. The era of big government is over. Americans hate government. Or so it seems. For four decades, the surest way to get elected has been to promise less of it. Government small enough to drown in a bathtub and lower taxes for everyone. We must give overcharged taxpayers some of their own money back. A giant, massive tax cut. But has it always been that way? They say everything that happens in America happens in California first. And maybe that's true. Long before Donald Trump's populism, before the Tea Party, before even the Reagan Revolution, one man in California went to war with government and changed our national politics, perhaps forever. Howard Jarvis for Proposition 13. You've got to remind the politicians who's boss. Howard Jarvis was angry. We got a lot of marinated bureaucrats in government, and they are on a big gravy train. He was fed up with politicians and government bureaucrats. No matter what a politician says, nobody believes it anymore. But most of all, he hated taxes. He visioned himself as a fighter for the average taxpayer who couldn't fight on their own. I'm damn he was just a force of nature. I have no doubt that this guy was going to shake things up. In 1978, Howard Jarvis would lead middle-class taxpayers on an anti-government crusade that ushered in a radical new vision of society. 
they were out marching to the local assessor's office, where they dumped bags of tea to show their anger over taxes, the Glendale Tea Party. With no love, there it is. Long after he left the scene, the movement he started would dominate American politics. There's probably about 100, 200,000 folks here that are upset about taxes, they're upset about the size of government. Giving rise to a new era of unfettered wealth at the top and austerity at the bottom, with government stretched to the limits, the era of the tax revolt. As you can see, that is uh, that promises what the rest of the documentary is, uh, a rip-roaring ride through more, more than one decade in California and indeed national politics. Jason, most people think of, of Prop 13 as the great California property taxpayers revolt of 1978. But I'm wondering if you can explain the case you make in, in The First Angry Man that this is really a conversation about race. Yeah, I mean, I think it's about a lot of things, Prop 13. It, 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 um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a Rorschach. Um, you know, different people see it a different way. Um, some people see it as the thing that kept them in their house or kept their mom or their, their, you know, their grandparents uh, in their house, kept them from being taxed uh, out of their, their family home. And uh, you know, I think that that's kind of the halo that remains over Proposition 13 and a lot of people still, I think like 60 some odd percentage of people who are polled about Prop 13 continue to think about it primarily in those terms. Uh, but there's definitely another side of it. And, um, you know, I think increasingly people are viewing it as the reason that California has had, you know, um, decades of, of fiscal crises and, uh, you know, an inability to accomplish so much of uh, what we want to accomplish as a, as a state and as a society in terms of, um, uh, you know, our, our public education and, and building healthy communities. Um, to get to your question about race, um, I think that's, you know, one of the more kind of the most controversial thing that we tackled in the film was, was talking about the degree to which race was central to the question of how we felt about how, how, how feelings about government in general were changing during this time period, the 1970s. Um, and that obviously affects how you feel about paying taxes. You're more willing to pay taxes if you are um, in favor of your, if you believe in your government and if you believe in sort of the shared goals that we, we have as a society and that your government is trying to, uh, to take on. And this was a period in the 1970s where that was really starting to come undone. You know, this, this sort of shared commitment that we, that we had and the consensus around the role that the positive role that government can play was really starting to fall apart. And I think, um, you know, we felt that it was important to talk about the, ro the role that race played in that. That, uh, you know, the fact that government had been taking on an increasingly activist role in terms of trying to create more um, equality, um, economic uh, and social opportunity for African Americans and other groups in this country during the 1960s and the 1970s, I think was one of the major contributing factors in terms of the, the negative uh, sentiment that people were starting to develop about um, American government and about California government, and that fed into the tax revolt. You know, it's, it's so interesting. There's this, so much of us, so many of us think of schools and school funding uh, and how that was directly impacted by the passage of Prop 13. Uh, here in California, th there seems to have, a, a, an attitude seems to have developed where it's like, I want my kids uh, to be educated by uh, the government, but I, I don't want, I don't want to pay for the other person's kids. That's right. Like, That's right. <laughs> I don't exactly understand where that comes from. You know, I have uh, friends who raise children in New Jersey and they don't have that attitude about their schools. <laughs> they pay a pretty penny. Uh, mm -hmm. But then they also get to see the result of that in terms of, of the, the quality of the public schools available for everybody's kids. Joe, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the impact of Prop 13 has been nationally. What, what sort of example California set and, and who, who all wanted to follow it and who all didn't? 
And you see now in in most states, um, uh, the picture is mixed, but you, I mean, if you, what is Prop 13? Prop 13 is, um, does a couple of different things, right? It is a, it is a, a cap on, on your property taxes and how much they can go up. Um, it is, it, it is a, it is a constitutional limit on local government of two, two thirds for taxation, though there are exemptions for that. And there's two thirds for uh, restriction on taxation state legislature. Um, we tend to focus on the property tax aspects and not the overall taxation. Um, you know, so some state, you know, states often limit um, property taxes, um, though, um, though California's limits are such that we are, um, you know, th that property tax is one place where our taxes are low. Um, we filled it in in other places. The, the picture may be very uh, different. Um, you know, uh, one place where the um, a lot of Californians go and where the Dodgers just won uh, the World Series last night is the suburbs of Dallas, um, where um, local taxation is much higher. Um, schools and services in places like Frisco or Plano, Texas are, are much higher, even if overall levels of taxation, obviously, at state level in Texas are much lower. Um, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's complicated. The, certainly what the film is really adept at pointing out is how the, the rhetoric, the style, the anti-tax style of Prop 13 um, won politically. Um, I'm not sure that anyone though, any real state has, has adopted a governance system, um, anything like the California post Prop 13 governance system, because Prop 13 is really that foundation. Um, and I think other states are wise not to have copied us in, in that regard, but certainly they, they copied more our style um, than our substance. But Joe, isn't it, wouldn't it be fair to say, if I may jump in and, and ask Joe a question, wouldn't it be fair to say that after Prop 13, there was a kind of contagion effect and, and states across the country started uh, implementing um, uh, some version of, of revenue limitation or, or tax limitation? Sure. I would say Prop 13 goes beyond revenue or tax limitation. It's really, um, I, would, I would think it's better to understand it and to see its impact. It's, it's, it's human limitation. It's limiting the ability of politicians, very any politician, of, lo of local state politicians to, to act, to have flexibility. Um, it puts things into formulas. It puts limits on things. Um, and, and really, Prop 13 is almost the foundational algorithm of these series of algorithms that interest groups of left and right have built since. Um, so in that case, you know, the, the term limits movement nationally and all sorts of things to rein, uh, rein in the ability of sort of human discretion within governance. Um, and, and, you know, and Prop 13 has that um, you know, has, when you do that, of course, and you, you know, I think what's really telling about Prop 13 is it sort of bakes in, it's, we're still living under it, right? We're still living in, under it and all this baked in. So there's another element to Prop 13 that gives the past much greater weight than the present or the future. Um, the fact that you're making a film about Howard Jarvis 42 years later, um, it, and, and Prop 13 itself as a document really tells us that we are uh, much more governed by ghosts uh, than we are governed by ourselves now, um, at least in the California context. I'd be very comfortable saying that. And to the extent certain other states have copied us, the, the governed by ghost problem is, is very much with us, which is why this is a great week to have this conversation uh, leading up to Halloween. <laughs> governed by ghosts. That sounds like a possible title of your next book, Joe. <laughs> well, I, I promise, uh, you know, th that we won't focus the entire conversation on Prop 13, but I do want to play one more clip from uh, the documentary First Angry Man, uh, particularly because it, it looks at the process of initiative campaigns, and I think that it's going to have re resonance for all kinds of conversations we'll be having later this hour. Jarvis hit the streets, recruiting volunteers to circulate petitions to amend the California Constitution. What it does is it won't allow them to raise your taxes above 1% of the assessed valuation of your home. Mm. So if you would sign here as you're 
In California, regular citizens have the power to propose laws for the state ballot through a petition process. But it's not easy. I was at a Home Depot, and a guy came out with plants in his cart. And I asked him, do you want to sign a petition to reduce property taxes? And he just kept going. I said, if you don't sign, you may not have a place to plant those plants. He turned right around, let me sign that. They felt empowered. They were no longer going to just sit back and have the government do to them whatever it is they wanted to do. Jarvis needed just under half a million signatures to get his amendment on the ballot. He got three times that, an unprecedented achievement in California politics. With the signatures gathered, the Jarvis Gann Initiative was headed to the 1978 ballot as California Proposition 13. And Jarvis's time in the political wilderness had come to a close. 75-year-old Howard Jarvis certainly doesn't look like the man who has just about every established politician in the state scared to death. But he does. So Prop 13, for certainly most of my life, and I'm going to guess for, for uh, the panelists here as well, has been acknowledged as the proverbial classic textbook third rail of politics. You cannot touch it and live in politics. But this year, we do have an attempt on this ballot to peel off the giant corporate giveaway uh, embedded in Prop 13. Rafe, I'm, I'm wondering what you make of Prop, 13, Prop 15, uh, which would basically force big commercial property owners back into the modern market for property taxes, so to speak. I mean, it, it looks really tight in terms of polling, so we're not going to try to game it here, figure out who's going to win it or lose it. But, but you know, it, this does seem to mark a very dramatic and belated attempt to address some of the inequities that Prop 13 raised. Well, progressives in California have been working for years to try to get what's called the split roll onto the ballot. And it, basically, it's to reveal the secret of Prop 13 which is that it's not all about homeowners. It's also about commercial property and commercial property doesn't turn over in the same way. And there's a lot of ways to make that work so that you don't have to pay a higher tax on a higher assessment. So essentially the taxpayers have been subsidizing that tax break that had it been voted on separately never would have passed in California. But it's a really hard lift, not because the basic argument of Prop 13 still dominates the world about government is no good, because actually government programs are still wildly popular. And they were in Prop 13's era, by the way, and to the same degree. Uh, but the notion of Prop 13 is feel, people feel it's about their home and their property taxes. So it becomes a very effective argument to say, I don't want to give you all the details about all this, but Prop 13. And if this were to pass, they'll be coming for your home next. And I expected that to be the argument, and it's an effective argument. I think it's extremely close. It may depend on who turns out. May I point out, though, Rachel, the electorate today in California doesn't look at all like the electorate in 1978. I mean, at all. Uh, support for government programs is off the charts in terms of spending. Uh, support for tax cuts is not very high. I think the tax cut era is not kind of where it was back in the 1970s. But Prop 13 still has this kind of um, heirloom feeling to it that it reflects something about the security of what your tax rates are. And don't forget, property still costs a lot in California. And it's a big deal about kids and what's going to happen with kids and home ownership. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it went either way. But if it were framed differently, if there was a vote on the commercial side of it and a vote on the home ownership side, the home ownership side would probably get 70% support and the commercial side would probably lose very badly. Uh, advocates like Prop 13, 15 have never quite been able to get out from under the shadow of 13, but let's just say they're in range and that's pretty remarkable. Let's, let's dial the history clock back to the 19s now. California is in the chokehold to the OG robber barons, <laughs> the guys who <laughs> built the railroads out here. And then a San Francisco attorney named Hiram Johnson runs for governor. Joe, tell us about Hiram. 
He had never run for anything before. Um, and I think he was, he was a very combative, angry, when you read his papers in the Bancroft Library at Berkeley, um, kind of had black moods, feels depressive, uh, but also a very charismatic, bombastic speaker, even a trial lawyer. Um, and I think it was not just him personality, but there, there are two aspects of the history that influenced our initiative process um, of Hiram and made him that we still live with him. Um, he's one of the ghosts we're governed by. Um, one is that he became famous very rapidly after the earthquake and fire of 1906 in, in San Francisco. Remember, he, like so many San Franciscans, lost their home, lost their, the place where they may have worked, um, were forced out of the city for periods of time. People were very angry and there were these graft trials. They put um, privately financed trials, put people, the bad guys of San Francisco on trial. And Johnson was one of the prosecutors. He actually took over for the lead prosecutor in the, biz, biz, in the biggest case after the lead prosecutor was shot through the head during the middle of the trial. This was an angry, violent time. Um, and so when Johnson ran right out of that into 1910, um, with a lot of the backing from people in San Francisco and also the backing of a, of a doctor named John Randolph Haynes from Los Angeles, um, who was interested in Swiss direct democracy and had it enacted in LA. But that, that anger and violence and kind of distrust of, of politics and the system were very much in Johnson. And, Direct democracy was a way of, uh, he campaigned on it, said he would enact it. Um, and he referred to the ballot initiative as a gun in a man's hand. He was, he was in a direct democracy of a style. You know, now we have 115 countries with direct democracy. No one does it like us. Very brutal, brute force, a style for political conflict. And when he won in 1910, and he decided to, to pursue direct democracy as, in a package of reforms that included women's suffrage, in a special election in his first year, 1911, when he decided how to design direct democracy, um, he was under a lot of political pressure because of his father, who was a sort of corrupt political figure from Sacramento um, named Grove Johnson, actually originally from Syracuse. He fled fraud charges in Syracuse, New York, ended up in Sacramento. Um, they had broken up their relationship in 1902. They broke up the family law practice. Grove was in Sacramento, Hiram went to San Francisco, Grove moved back to Sacramento, was governor for six years, they lived two blocks away, they never spoke. Um, and, and Hiram was trying to show that, you know, he was under great pressure to show that he wasn't secretly controlled by his father, that he was different than his father. And, and that, and he latched on direct democracy and gave us a direct democracy that has really almost no role for the legislature in it. You know, once you do something by ballot initiative here in California, it can't be undone except for another vote of the people, unless the measure, it's the lex language of the measure um, allows it. That's incredibly rare in the world, that kind of inflexibility and, and that separation. Uh, you know, direct democracy in a lot of places is communication between the legislature and the, and the people, often using the referendum, the tool where the legislature passes something and the people vote it down. There's only one referendum on the ballot this year, Prop 25. Um, you know, this was, he designed a system that was brutal for conflict and had, and had no role for the legislature, no check on it, um, that allowed people to lock in their preferences, whether it was their preferred property tax formula or what have you. Um, and so we live with that combative personality. We live with Hiram Johnson's daddy issues and they're embodied to this day in this initiative process. Rafe. As, as Joe was just explaining, nobody else does it the way we do. Why has this brutal populist system lasted all these decades, a century well, now? Because it's much deeper, although it's, it's great about Hiram Johnson at the center of it, but the, he was embedded in a broader progressive movement of middle-class reformers that found its home in California. I grew up on the East Coast, and this was a rebellion against East Coast politics and government not just against the railroads, but eventually when it got down to the city and county level where there was direct democracy, well, it was against machine politics of all kinds, bosses and machines. And to go to Jason's point, race even had a piece in that over time, which is those machines were built in favor of immigrant communities in the East Coast and the Midwest. And there was a feeling that this should be middle-class government that would be, quote, clean, 
directed by the people and politicians are dirty. Sounds a little bit like Howard Jarvis, doesn't it? That politicians are, are kind of thieves. Well, in California, they were thieves, so it kind of helped <laughs> to make the case. But even where they were not thieves, this progressive movement, which had many great virtues, no question about it in terms of anti-corruption legislation, ethics commissions, um, honorable, pre preventing conflict of interest, also often prevented participation, uh, either inadvertently or purposely, uh, to keep the field of politics to people who would favor something called go good government, which is not always very inclusive. In many ways, though, the voters turned out to not be fools. The, um, a great political scientist, V.O. Key, said the voters are not fools. And what they meant by that is you can confuse them, you can baffle them, you can give them an impossible situation, and very often they'll figure it out, which is why two-thirds of the ballot measures have been defeated by voters that have made it to the ballot. Just the ease of getting it onto the ballot. I mean, you can buy your way onto a ballot with an initiative right now. It's not the hardest thing. You could do a ballot initiative that everybody has to wear orange t-shirts every day. And with enough money, you could get it on the ballot, but it'll lose. And a lot of crazy stuff doesn't actually get into law when the voters get through the muck, like we're looking at this year, and decode who's for it and who's against it, and listen to trusted sources of information. Now, you shouldn't have a system where the voters have to work that hard, which we could talk about later. But anyway, I think it's a mixed picture. I, I think some good things have gotten done. Um, but it really is the, the impact of progressivism as a movement, which was a vast movement of which Hiram Johnson was at the center, but was not the creator or the only person. I, I just want to roll back a little bit. We have a listener question uh, for, for Rafe. Wouldn't a separate vote on 13 still affect small business owners? Well, it's hard to say because, and I'm not advocating for or against any measure, but I, you, know, you do know that Prop 15 exempts certain, a lot of small businesses from uh, the split role impact. I think at the end of the day, if it was treated as tax for homeowners and tax for businesses, then voters would have enough information to make an informed choice. Right now, I think voters are stuck. I think they're going, they like a lot about Prop 13 and you worry about the unknown. And uh, people also don't necessarily favor breaks for large commercial enterprises. But unfortunately, you only can vote on the choice that's handed to you. And on both sides, it's kind of an all or nothing choice. A lot of Californians are, are, you know, quite proud of how liberal this state largely is. And election after election has just borne this out pretty much, I don't know, for the last 50 years or so. But propositions often give us an opportunity to see where many voters hold deeply conservative viewpoints, viewpoints that aren't mirrored by our largely Democratic representatives. Representatives, uh, Jason, I'm I'm thinking now of, of Prop 187 back in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if you could sort of summarize that for us, and, and maybe talk about the ways that that we see again this kind of populism rising up to say to the politicians, "No, we want to go in a different direction." Yeah. So, I mean, I I didn't deal directly with Prop 187 in in my film. There were. Um, but, but I did think about it a lot in terms of uh, asking myself how justified we were to talk about race underlying these changes in California at that time. And, um, and it, I think that the, the existence of Prop, of Prop 187, which was a, uh, you guys can correct me, uh, but it was a, a, an initiative that was intended to deprive um, undocumented immigrants of certain social services um, in California. Um, and then there was another one, which was one to make uh, California an English only, you know, official English as an official language, basically a way of sort of depriving rights from, uh, you know, Spanish speakers and Vietnamese speakers and Chinese speakers in, in this country, in the state. Um, the, the fact that these kinds of initiatives uh, followed kind of hot on the heels of Prop 13 made me feel like, you know, it was clear that what Howard Jarvis was tapping into was a kind of unspoken uh, xenophobia, you know, that, that was happening in California, that it wasn't, it was maybe considered a little bit, you know, po politically incorrect to say these things out loud and 
Um, and uh, a legitimate politician in the state legislature or a governor might be uh, disinclined to take on these issues because it might be considered indelicate or racist. Um, but, you know, in the hands of the sort of impersonal uh, initiative system, um, which kind of unleashes the id, I guess, in a sense of, um, of a society, uh, because it allows uh, people in a kind of anonymous way to sign on to, um, to certain kinds of actions that, you know, that if they had to put their name to it, they might not want to do it. Um, there, you, you start to see a picture of a society kind of struggling with these issues um, and doing it through the initiative process. Um, you know, I think that we've kind of worked our way through that in California, but there was a, you know, clearly a time in the late 1970s through the 1980s um, when these kind of things that these, you know, which I think it's pretty safe to say that, you know, race is at the heart of them and they're, you know, kind of fairly racist kinds of measures um, were, were bubbling up through the initiative system at that time. Joa, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. We, we heard from Rafe, you know, that Obviously, Californians aren't easily, you know, suckered. You know, we put on our glasses, we get out the pens, we make notes, you know, around election time. You know, what do you, okay, you say this proposition is about puppies, but is it though? Right? <laughs> you know, I like puppies, but what is this proposition actually doing? And, and so often we, we say no. When in doubt, we tend to say no to a proposition. Uh, but but we saw with 187 that you know a, a Republican governor who wanted to hit on that note could could really rally people because they had strong feelings that they felt were you know finally if you will being acknowledged out in the open. I think that's right. I, I think it's 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 um that's true. I, I actually think more recent years, and I I would recommend the work of Manuel Pastor, and I mean really recent, just the this century. Is, a, is more the departure. Um, and when you look at ballot measures and how we view race is intersected, um, it's a feature of the whole time. I mean, before we had the initiative referendum, the ability of people outside the government to initiate measures, we had a lot of measures, you know, put on by the ballot in the legislature, 1880, 1910, uh, that were racist that enacted um, and advanced anti-Asian racism and a host of other things. The initiative process is used sort of directly on that in, in some cases early on. Um, perhaps, you know, obviously in the 1964, I think I'm saying that right, Rafe? Um, you know, our fair housing law was effectively overturned by a ballot initiative. Um, and even in, the, in those 1910s and 20s, you see a lot of measures. Uh, one of the most common things was actually to, was sort of temperance, um, to limit alcohol. And those had a sort of racial and anti-immigrant um, cast to them as well. They were they were anti-Catholic um, in, in some cases. Um, some of the, the nastiness that um, an anti-immigrant feeling that drove prohibition was very much um, in that. So, you know, you, I mean, you still see uh, aspects of it. And, and you know, we're, you know, those, uh, Daniel Hosang's not here, but he wrote a wonderful book about racial propositions um, where he talked about 187 um, and certainly, um, um, War Connolly's amendment from uh, 209 from 1996, which we have a pretty much a straight repeal of on the ballot um, right now, um, Proposition 16. Um, again, having that on the ballot, uh, Prop, Prop 209 is actually of a piece, I would think, of most of California history. Prop 16, the ability to roll that back and to vote, you know, affirmatively for affirmative action. That's actually new. That's uh, that's that's the historic departure. We're living through some very interesting history now. Could I dig into that 1964 thing? Because I spent a sure lot of time yeah. on that in my research. <laughs> you know, 19, Prop 13 happened as part of a wave that was growing that was about to take over nationally, a conservative wave. Prop 14 in 1964 might seem like an anomaly, except for what Jason's saying about how the id comes out and, and you need to know what people really think if you're going to bring about social change in a society that's divided by race. The ballot that Prop 14, which rolled back the Rumford Fair Housing Act of 1963, was on the same ballot in which Lyndon Johnson won more than 60 percent of the vote. Liberalism had reached its absolute top point since Franklin Roosevelt, since 1936. Those two elections 
were very similar. And people were saying it's going to be the beginning of an era that's going to go X, Y, and Z. Well, by 1968, the Republicans had cemented a majority in national politics, and it grew out of race. And the thermometer piece, if, pe if people had read it correctly, was Prop 14, because many Democrats who voted for Lyndon Johnson, including many Demo Republicans who voted for Lyndon Johnson, voted for Prop 14. And it sent a message across the country that wasn't picked up the way Prop 13 was because Democrats were in, in heaven that this was going to go on forever. Two years later, they got absolutely destroyed in congressional elections and race was a part of that. And in 68, the Nixon majority came. So you raised it, Rachel, which it's sometimes how people vote for candidates and parties doesn't reflect the whole story of what's going on. And California has had this amazing ability, sometimes to a horrifying degree, to tap into that. And suddenly the oil, you know, starts coming out through the, uh, I don't know what the analogy is. I don't know enough about oil, but it's you know. a gusher. A gusher, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> Rafe, I would, I would add that the Prop 14 uh, was also probably more than anything, the thing that got Reagan elected over, yes. uh, over Pat Brown. Oh, wow. Two years later. Term. Yeah, and we're and we're not happy about that at the Pat Brown Institute that that happened right. a few years later. Yes, that's right. Here's just one historical fact that I think maybe blows people's minds about California, but just to to, to recognize it, um, you know, the the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution, the equal protection, citizenship, you know, uh, was ratified and added to the U.S. Constitution in 1866. Back then, California didn't ratify. California only ratified that in 1959. That's when we ratified the 14th Amendment in, in California. It was a point that Pat Brown, after Pat Brown was elected. Just, I mean, there's a continuum in California, um, you know, as this, you know, it has to do with, you know, I would recommend a lot of the work that Kelly Lytle Hernandez has done, um, you know, this sort of continuum of, of you know what the academics call the the sort of settler culture, um, and this notion of this as being, um, and I think and, and Rafe said it in relation to the progressives, this clean place, this place that was going to be beyond um, certain things, and and that cleanliness to a lot of people meant white. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to encourage everyone uh, who's uh, listening, watching now to, to put in your questions. Uh, I, I am keeping an eyeball, one, one eyeball on them, and I'm, I'm going to get to as many of them as I can this hour. Uh, I promise not to hog these panelists, even though, you know, I have questions, so many questions of my own to put to them. Rake, you mentioned the 68 Nixon majority, and, you know, I, I just think the way that they were able to sort of peel off the the Catholic de Democratic vote with the abortion issue is, I mean, like, should be required reading for anybody going into politics or covering politics mm -hmm. today. So many in the media and the academy fail to recognize the power of religion in California. And I think you can see where I'm headed with this one. I'm, I'm about to talk about Proposition 8 which made California the 29th state to pass a constitutional amendment banning marriage equality after the California Supreme Court ruled uh, in May of that year that marriage was a fundamental right for same-sex couples. I think there were a lot of sort of people in, in sort of elite liberal circles who were surprised. They were completely not expecting this. And yet it, it was a very loud populist message sent from the ballot box. And that was on the same ballot with Barack Obama. Don't forget. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a lot of people in minority communities voted for Proposition 8 as a result of social conservatism. One of the things the proposition process gives you the right to do, which is an interesting thing to think about, you can vote one way for the party because you want that party to make decisions about the allocation of goods. And you can vote on a proposition on your belief on social issues. Oddly enough, the Republicans had always calculated that all those Prop 8 voters would become Republican voters. But again, the voters rule. The voters decide what they're going to do. We can't tell the voters what to do. And they may say, you know what, until I change my mind, which, by the way, most of these voters did on same-sex marriage within a couple of years, I can vote one way on social issues, and that doesn't make me a supporter of the party that on Social Security 
is that conservative party. So I think Republicans banked on that Prop 8 victory much more than they, they should have. And eventually the Democratic Party found a way to bring people back into the fold. And if you poll the same people today who would have voted for Prop 8 in, in 2008, they're not in, that, they're not in that camp. But again, I always start with where the voters are. And just like in 1964, they were going to vote for a Democrat for president. And they were very conservative on an issue that was about to change very, very quickly. It also argues, Rachel and everybody, for patience in the long term to win these battles in American politics. It's probably not enough to win elections for your party. You've got to really move people at a really deep level to get them. Otherwise, you get surprised all the time, and the surprises are really good. Politics and, politics and surprises don't go too well together, usually. It's usually a bad surprise. But no, it's usually that, a bad surprise for the people who have a strong opinion that goes the other this way. This is not always a liberal state. And when you look at the results of this election in November, you're going to find exactly the same thing, that on taxes, on issues about policies regarding race and ethnicity, it continues to be a democratic state, as democratic as it can be, but not liberal at all times in all matters. And so we no longer have the, we no longer should be as surprised as we usually are when we see those two things happening. Jason, I, I, maybe you can take this next question from Renee. Uh, what would it take to reform the initiative process to limit the worst possibilities, but allow for some exercise of direct democracy and, and a check on legislative corruption or inaction? So, you know, on that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to punt that to Joe because everything <laughs> I know about that, and I could talk about it, but everything I know I got from his book, uh, which is a terrific book. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> and, and, and Joe has, I think Joe has a, a lot of thoughts about how we can reform the reforms to make California work better within our system of direct democracy. So why don't you take that, Joe? Well, I'll try to answer that by, thank you, by, by also referring to Rafe's um, question. Um, I mean, there, the, the, the simple answer is there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, there are a lot of other states um, that do this better than us. Um, Colorado, uh, I, I also globally, I, I, I co-president of something called a Global Forum of Modern Direct Democracy with a Swiss journalist and a big network of people all over the world that study and gather data on direct democracy. If you're interested, if there's a site online you can search called the Democracy Direct Democracy Navigator. But um, I, I recommend the way Taiwan, which is a very new process, does it. Also, Switzerland and Germany do it pretty well in the German states. But the real question is integration. It's sort of integrating your 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 ballot measure process into your governance. The big mistake we made in California and a lot of Western United States is we integrated our initiative process, our ballot measure process with our elections. As you're seeing, you're voting at the same time, uh, on the same calendar as our elections. Uh, you know, it's on the same list as candidates. But, but when you're voting for ballot measures, you're actually not voting for representatives. It's very different. You're acting as a lawmaker. Um, and you really need to pay more attention to what's in the measure. Uh, a lot of places in the world that do this better than us separate the calendars for for when they vote on ballot measures, when they um, vote on 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 ballot when they vote on ballot measures and candidates. Um, they also do it in a way that makes it more directly part of the legislative process. Um, you know, people pass a, we pass budgets in June here, but then change can screw up a budget in November with what we do on the ballot. It would be make sense to sort of try to think of ways to sort of integrate these processes. And the biggest change, of course, is the inflexibility. Um, Rafe mentioned Prop 8. What people, what the folks behind Prop 8 were trying to do with banning same-sex marriage was to use the inflexibility of the process to, to lock in a view now before it changed. They saw people moving towards believing in marriage equality. They wanted to lock it in. And effectively, they did. I mean, the voters didn't overturn Prop 18, Prop 8. Ultimately, the United States Supreme Court did. Um, and that is the story of direct democracy in California that makes it so tragic. This thing that's supposed to be democratic to bring people into the system actually has this anti-democratic cast because of that inflexibility, because of, that, you, that it can't be changed by our elected representatives. It's so hard to change things. 
Um, what that means is that, um, you know, it's a way to lock in yesterday's preferences and bind future generations. And, you know, Rafe counsels patience and that I really disagree with Rafe. We have way too much patience. We should, we need to be out of, impa out of patience, deeply impatient. I mean, the, the property taxes on my home were set by voters when I was four years old, you know? The education funding formula for my kids' schools, I have three kids in the public schools, were set when I was a freshman in high school. You know, those are the sorts of things that I should be deciding, not that my dead grandparents decided. And it's, it's that aspect, that locking in, that really unifies Prop 13 and, and, all, and all these other different propositions um, we've had. I mean, I mean, even the, the if you if you indulge me a second, I mean, the story of Prop 13 itself goes back to a formula. There was a formula before it where there was a great scandal in 1965 and 66 where the property assessors of different counties um, were exposed as keeping assessments of houses artificially low. Um, often there were bribes and payoffs for doing this, and for commercial property as well. Um, they kept things low you know, for, for uh, on houses for electoral reasons, often the bribes were for commercial properties. And when the scandals exposed, the state came in and imposed a formula and said it, that you had to make property taxes based on 25% of market value. Um, it, it's a cousin, it was a cousin of Prop 15, which I'm skeptical of. <laughs> but, um, and then when conditions changed, suddenly there was a formula and, and taxes soared up under the formula and your elected assessors couldn't cheat, couldn't change things to keep things down. And then you have the reaction of Prop 13, which builds on a formula. And there's a sort of sense of another formula and another formula and another formula. That's really kind of the story. And I think this process in, in California can be very powerful. It can be participatory, but it requires integrating with the legislative process getting rid of this this inflexibility and also making it usable on more of a scale where it's not just people with money but it's actually people with ideas there there are deliberative processes that are used all over the world and used in california in different contexts that could be brought to bear um but we're not having that conversation and and i just i just think you know i, I agree with everything else ray says but the but the notion of having patience after well, me, 101 years of this, no, I, I'm impatient. I'm, I encourage you to be impatient. Okay, so before <laughs> you beat me over the head too much, patience doesn't mean what you think it means. What I mean is when you think you've elected your candidate or your party and you're done, you're not done because it's very possible that there's a ballot measure at the same time where a lot of the people who voted for your candidate are going in a really different direction on something you think is important. So all patience means, I'm one of the least patient people in the world, is social change means you elect the people and you also find out what else you've got to watch out for that same day, which may be Prop 8, it may be something else. You've got more work to do. That's all that is. So let's let the patience thing go. I would like to agree with Joe on one thing, but talk about things that I think also could make a big difference. I don't like people passing by a majority things that require a two-thirds vote to do other things. I think that's ridiculous. I think you are binding people to future things where a third can, can really control the two-thirds. We've got enough trouble with that at the national level right now. I've been focusing a lot on what tools can we give voters so that they know what the heck is going on with these propositions. I got this thing in the mail and I do have a PhD. And this was harder than my qualifying exams uh, that I took. And I don't need the text of everything. I don't, I mean, there's such a thing as too much information and the wrong information. What voters need is good information. Like when you go to a restaurant, you want to find out if there's, if it's got like a good health rating and people really like the food and don't like the food. I get much more use from what journalists write about these measures than I do from what the state sends me. I also have no idea who supports and opposes these things. When I read something that says um, parent on the con argument or the pro con, this is a city of a state of 40 million people. And if it says something like teachers for good things or you know residents for happiness, 
I don't know what the heck that is. I think we should be starting all over again with a very small bit of information that tells you a few things. Who put this on the ballot? Who paid for the signatures? Um, what organizations support it? And no organizations with goofy names unless you find out who funds that organization. And most of the time I decide based on who supports it and who opposes it and get some actual information. And I do want to find some things that are buried in these measures that people don't know about, like three quarters vote requirements and things like that that don't really make it into the discussion. Joe makes a point about deliberative democracy. There is a great movement for deliberative democracy. One of my classmates in graduate school, Jim Fishkin, is one of the leaders of this in Texas. They bring people together, give them useful information. Not only do they make good decisions, but they like each other better. They get along better with people from the other party. It's a wonderful thing. Now, we can't do that very much with presidential elections, although he did, but we could certainly do it with propositions, certainly could do it with propositions, and I would go to that. But really, I mean, too much of the wrong information, and I have to throw out everything that comes in the mail, you know, a, a month before the election, because none of it helps me to decide. Help, th think of it from the voter's standpoint. What's good for the voter, not what's good for the advocates, what's good for the system, what does the voter need to decide? And then I'll- now I'm, gonna, now I'm gonna ask you guys, uh, you know, I'll punch back from the opposite direction. I mean, I, I think a lot of California voters feel a great deal of emotional and intellectual satisfaction sometimes, punching back at, proposition, uh, at politicians with propositions that, that blast through their inflexibility or mm -hmm their hopeless gridlock on hot button issues. Uh, what I'm thinking of right now is Prop 64, legalizing marijuana. There was so much resistance at all mm -hmm. levels of government. Obviously, the prop couldn't do anything about the federal government. But you know, even now, even after a fairly resounding vote on 64, we see resistance at, at the local and state levels. It is, is our proposition system not good for things like that? when voters want to go in a direction that their political leaders are refusing to go. You can bet I'm not going to use the word patience. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a long-term battle. And when the government wants to go in another direction, one proposition is probably not enough. You got to probably do another one. And I have no problem with the voters using propositions to beat up on people in government who aren't doing what they want. I mean, that's, there's a long tradition of that. I would yeah, I mean, but I, I think, you know, and to, to support what, what Rachel's saying, I mean, I, I, I personally am very frustrated with, with our initiative system. I think it, we're, you know, as, as somebody who's a little bit closer than you two maybe to being like a normal voter, um, I get really frustrated with, with having to make decisions about who gets diabetic care, you know, dialysis. It's just, I just don't feel like that is my personal bailiwick and I can't understand why every two years I'm required to make decisions about this. And, and I feel like um, uh, that, you know, the idea of direct democracy is, is fine, but it shouldn't be in opposition to the idea of uh, representative democracy, d democracy through our elected representatives. That should work well, you know, that uh, elective, representatives should be uh, empowered to do this work because that's their full-time job. They have staffs um, and we should figure out a way of making that system work better instead of having, you know, every mom and pop sitting there trying to figure this stuff out. So if you're going to say that, you know, we shouldn't be making decisions about dialysis, then I think, you know, even though we might all think that, you know, marijuana should be legal, you know, I guess one way of asking this question would be, is there a way of, of, of reforming the initiative system in such a way that you limit the topics, you limit the subjects on which we can all vote? Um, you know, maybe things that are just I'm not too, like, that are like, not too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, are, there are, in a lot of places in the world, there are some pretty extreme limits that, that special interests get carved out. Like in certain German states, you can't vote on matters of trash because the trash industry took those off the table. That's not so good. 
But um, <laughs> Prop 64 is a great example of the problem, right? Here's a direction that you want to go, that a lot of people in California want to go, but you pass a ballot initiative, and that becomes the structure. And it's this very inflexible structure, and there's not a lot of room for the legislature or regulators to change it. So this policy that we want is not actually going very well in this inflexible structure. Um, and, and that's because we have this dynamic of initiative. We use the initiative tool in direct democracy so much here with this great inflexibility. So there's this dynamic. It's not an interplay with batting back ideas between the people, the voters, and the politicians. It's actually a game where they keep trying to go around each other. They, they're sort of, it's a conflict where they, you know, the voters try to close one thing down and, and then legislators find fascinating ways around it. I mean, the most valued people in, in California, the most valued person in the state capitol now is a woman named Ana Mano Santos, who works for Governor Newsom, who has a genius about finding little ways around the sea of constitutional rules and budget things. I mean, she's, she's just amazing at it. That's not what you want. You know, right. the, Swiss, the Swiss have been doing this longer than us, and they use the referendum, and they have both a process that favors the referendum, our process pushes you towards the initiative in part because it's inflexible, it feels more powerful. Um, and it's pretty much the same, it's actually a little harder to get a referendum on the ballot than an initiative because of time limits. But in a process that favors the initiative, the referendum, they're used to a culture and a process and a way of doing things where, you know, it's, you're gonna do something big, there's, there's an interest in marijuana legalization and the legislature, the legislature, the parliament will do something, and then the people will say no two or three times maybe, and it goes back and forth over a period of years, and there's a debate. And also when you have, when you're voting on these things, you're looking not at a long list, a, a giant ballot like we're looking at now, but you're looking at two or three measures at a time every three months on a separate mail ballot um, while your candidates in Switzerland are every two years like us. Um, so there's this, this notion of a, of a conversation that never ends. That's, I think that's more dem democracy. There isn't a final word. There's just that time's results. Mm -hmm. Or we have this notion of wanting the initiative to be the final word, the place to lock in. And, and that makes our process very anti-democratic because in a real democracy, there is no final word. There is no lock-in. There, you know, there's, there's, there's much more movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll use the word patience in, 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 in saying that, you know, our system, yeah, and you, you're what you're waiting for often in our system is someone, either the legis a, a big supermajority in the legislature or someone with a lot of money to come in and change the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, it's just not a flexible process. We need that, we need a more direct democracy. Ours is kind of a workaround, it's indirect. Yeah. You know, it's really strange to watch what happens in other states with propositions like Florida, where the voters overwhelmingly supported uh, giving ex-felons the right to vote. And the legislature and the governor immediately set about making that impossible to happen and managed with their allies in the federal judiciary to basically gut something that the voters had clearly favored. There's other states that did where the legislature did not want to pass the Medicaid expansion. And it was only voters in Republican-leaning states who overwhelmingly favored it. But even then, the legislature's fought. But I think, I think Joe and I are kind of agreeing on this, which is there's a hauling and pulling between the legislature and the voters that may not be unhealthy. I mean, if those voters hadn't passed those measures in those very conservative states, those issues would never even make it to the agenda of the legislature. Because issues don't get on the agenda because the public wants them always. It's, it, there's plenty of other reasons why they do or, or don't. I don't want to give up on the proposition process. I want to make it way better, way more informative. But like Joe, I don't think they should be designed to solve the problem. Because problems don't actually get solved. You, you work on them. You, you, you work the problem. And you work on it. And you also hope new people enter the electorate, which, you mean, it, which is why you don't want to have initiatives that lock things in so you can't change your mind. I, I wouldn't mind if they had sunset clauses. I think that would be a very healthy thing. Um, but sometimes you have to shake up the elected officials, even when you vote for them, even when you agree with them, even when you're, they're your friends in Sacramento. They may just be sitting on something that isn't really very high on their radar until a bunch of people who don't care about other issues but care about that one are willing to stand at the grocery line 
and get signatures or some rich person, you know, sometimes they have good ideas, you know, we'll get something on the ballot, but it's not the end. It's the middle of the discussion, but it's a different discussion than legislators. I mean, who cares about discussions they have in the legislature? No offense, man, but really it's not very interesting to all the rest of us, but a hot proposition for or against, boy, people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so I think, just very I, quickly, and, I, and then Jason, I'll, I'll let, let you jump in. Remind us about what, what are sunset clauses? A sunset clause says something goes out of effect after a certain number of years and either has to be revoted on, uh, but if it's not revoted on, it doesn't exist anymore. It can be a 10 year sunset, it could be a, a six year sunset, um, but it, it allows you to not put all your eggs in one basket. Look how much our electorate changes every 10 years. You can just tell from the census. Joe's right. Let, the, let each generation make its own bed and lie in it. Isn't that kind of the point of direct democracy? It is not to, to have your grandchildren's future determined by something you voted on 30, 40 years ago. Not governed by ghosts. Jason. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with all of the reforms that both Rafe and Joe are suggesting. I mean, um, you know, Prop 13, for example, was passed by, I think, 65% of the voters, and it requires a 66% vote uh, for any, you know, new taxes. So it's, you know, it didn't, it didn't meet its own threshold. And, and I agree with Rafe that, that those kind of um, initiatives are ridiculous, you know, that require 51% um, or you need 51% of the vote to require 66% of the vote. Um, to get something, to change something is, is silly. And I agree with the idea of sunsetting uh, laws because absolutely, I mean, we get stuck with these things and it is extremely inflexible. But I guess that the, what I would push back on is um, that, that I think that voters in California um, are, get very frustrated with their, with their government, with their elected representatives, and yet they have very little idea the extent to which their elected representatives are hamstrung by the, the laws that we as voters have saddled them with and how the extent to which the, the job of being a governor or a, you know, a, a um, state representative or senator in California is basically figuring out how to connect all of the formulas and, um, you know, this sort of, this, this intricate web of laws that have been passed through the initiative process that give um, the elected representatives, who we think have all this power, but it actually gives them very, very little room to maneuver. Um, and, and I just think that Californians just have very little sense of the extent to which we've, we've created kind of an impossible system for our elected representatives. Well, that leads us to, to a question from Felicia. Are students in California being educated effectively about civics and how to participate in the political process? Oh, man. I've been a political science teacher for you know, so many decades. We think about this all the time. Clearly, no. Uh, by the way, the civics training I got wasn't very useful you know, in high school many years ago. Civics has to be an action agenda, which is how you can take action, how you can participate right off the bat. So, you know, a civics class today should be talking about what these ballot measures are and really providing a useful way for students to deliberate and learn about it. But it's hard because for the movement in, in public education is so much toward teaching for the test and uh, people have treated civics like it's an afterthought. Now, Cal State and the UC are trying to, to make some progress in keeping or getting civic education in the curriculum. It is really hard to do it with all the other demands in, in terms of math and science, which are very valid things, but civic seems kind of like, I don't know, it's like literature or something. But to me, civics is breathing. So the question is, how do you learn to breathe in a democracy? I think we have to invest in it much more. I'm not sure we should call it civics, by the way. Civics just sounds like, um, you know, eating your vegetables. Um, I think it needs a better name, and when I come up for it, I'll, I'll give you all a call, and I'll let you know. I have a, around the world, you're seeing, the answer to this is not, I think, civics classes, but to let, is learn by doing. You're seeing in a lot of places, yep. much more than the United States, 
the growth of youth parliaments, youth governments, which actually have real powers. Um, I think the direct democracy in California would be a great way to bring people in. Let kids sign petitions. That, that, that would be um, one way to open the process and let, let kids govern themselves. I mean, you, you, you see this a little bit in the deliberative democracy space that Rafe was talking about before with participatory budgeting, um, a little bit of kids in high schools, though um, not to the extent you see in uh, the cities of Phoenix or parents France, where, he, where significant parts of school budgets um, and even district budgets have been turned over to votes of, of students, uh, usually at the high school level. Um, the only place I can find in California which has real youth democracy is a small town of 10,000 people called Gonzales in the Salinas Valley in Monterey County, which has a youth city council that has actually drafted um, city ordinances. Um, and has such a democratic culture that when they decided to change the playgrounds, the two to six year old playgrounds in town, they had essentially a citizens assembly of four and five year olds presented the three different plans and then went with the four and five year old vote. That is rare, but it works very well there. And I think more of that in California would make a big difference in really teaching people how civics is supposed to work. Well, that's, that's a hard proposal to beat. <laughs> Who's going to say no to a four to five year old? It goes to what Jason's saying, which is it's one thing for legislators to say I'm hamstrung. It's another thing to say, here's five decisions we're complaining about. Let's give up some power over those five decisions so that people can learn that how decisions get made and what we deal with. That's a lot more powerful than them trying to get us to understand how hard their jobs is, which, by the way, in, in any democracy, especially in the U.S., that is a hopeless quest because we just don't really sympathize too much with them. But anytime you give up a piece of the decision process to the people, people actually grab hold of it and start thinking about it. If anybody's been on a jury, they know that's how the jury system works. And we should treat voters more like jurors, mm -hmm. except with better food. <laughs> Well, I, I like the idea of, of sort of closing on this note of power to the people redefined. <laughs> um, well, I, I do want to remind uh, everyone who's been watching this that we have been recording it so that you, you can uh, subscribe to Cal Humanities YouTube channel and watch again or encourage your favorite four or five year old to watch afresh <laughs> and get some ideas as to how to take over the state. <laughs> because it's about damn time. Anyway, please join me in thanking our panelists today, Joe Matthews, Jason Cohn, and Rafe Sunshine. This has been a, a great conversation, and I'm actually feeling hopeful after listening to this. <laughs>